When you go above one mile in altitude in North Carolina, the world changes. In the cooler, thinner air, the trees, flowers, birds, mammals, and fish are different. 43 of North Carolina's peaks measure over 6,000 feet, and they are truly islands in the sky. One of these giants is among the greatest natural monuments in Eastern America and is located northeast of Asheville in the Black Mountains. It is Mount Mitchell, which at 6,684 feet is the tallest mountain east of the Mississippi River. Today we are going to climb one and a quarter miles above sea level to explore the mysteries of this American landmark. Much of the first 20 years of my life were spent about 35 miles just south of here in the Bat Cave community. It was during the early 1950s that my parents brought me to this spot on Mount Mitchell. And it was also during this period that I learned about the Black Mountains and about the man who measured many of them, Elisha Mitchell, who was buried on the peak of this mountain, which now bears his name. Going to the top of Mount Mitchell and other North Carolina peaks Topping out over 6,000 feet is like traveling to another state or country. For every 1,000 feet one travels above sea level, it is like traveling 300 miles north. That is why when you reach the top of Mount Mitchell, it is like a trip of 2,000 miles into the Canadian wilderness. Plants on the mountain include red spruce and Fraser fir and such birds as the cedar waxwing that normally nest far to the north of our state. The story of Elisha Mitchell begins in Chapel Hill, North Carolina in the early part of the 19th century when the young Yale College graduate began teaching at the nation's first state university, which had less than 100 students at the time. Today, Professor Holden Thorpe, like the young Professor Mitchell, wears many hats at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He is a professor of chemistry, but he also happens to be director of the world famous Moorhead Planetarium. I asked Professor Thorpe about the early days of the university and the multi-talented Professor Mitchell. When Elisha Mitchell arrived in Chapel Hill in 1818, he was in for a big shock because he came here from Yale College, which was a big university, to a place that only had 93 students, three professors, and a president. And they all had to do all the jobs of the university. And it's amazing when you compare that to today with thousands of students and thousands of faculty here in Chapel Hill. You can imagine that in a university with only three faculty, that Elisha Mitchell was called on to teach a lot of different subjects. And those included his area of chemistry, but also mathematics, botany, zoology, geology, mineralogy, and even Latin. And in addition to having to do so many different academic jobs, he was also bursar of the university, commissioner of the university, justice of the peace, and preacher to the university every Sunday morning. Mitchell was an accomplished academic, teacher, and scholar, but he also took very seriously his role as servant to the state. And so in addition to his fields of geology and chemistry, he also studied the geology of the gold region of North Carolina and made observations of storms and meteorology. And he began to travel the state when he took charge of the North Carolina Geological Survey in 1825. And this is when he probably first saw from a distance the Black Mountains. In 1825, it was widely believed that Mount Washington in New Hampshire was America's tallest mountain. It was rocky and had no trees on top. This was not because it was taller, but because it was much farther to the north of North Carolina. Most also believe that the rugged Grandfather Mountain was the tallest in North Carolina. Elisha Mitchell was encouraged by Governor Swain and others to actually measure the taller peaks of the state. So Elisha Mitchell was being encouraged to measure the heights of these peaks, but how do you do it? 
Well, that's, I think, where his broad background comes in. Because chemists, particularly in that time, were interested in the behavior of gases. And there's a logical connection between the behavior of gases and measuring barometric pressure. And so if anyone in North Carolina was going to use that method to measure the height of a peak, it would be Elijah Mitchell. Even though science has become much more specialized today, the great scientists of today are people who not just are good at their field, but who know how to communicate, know how to work with people, and understand how their research applies to the larger world. And in that sense, Elijah Mitchell was a great role model for all of us doing science today. Mitchell's skill set also included the label of meteorologist. To explain barometric pressure and altitude, I went to meteorologist extraordinaire Greg Fischel of Raleigh. Well, a barometer is a weather instrument that measures air pressure, which in simplest terms is the weight of the air above you. And the reason that meteorologists are so interested in that is that it, it is differences in air pressure that dictate wind direction and wind speed. And so we're not only interested in knowing what the air pressure is here, but also in various locations all around us. The pressure differences between the Piedmont and the mountains are huge. Uh, here in the Piedmont, we may be looking at readings 29 and a half, 29 and three quarter inches, and then you head up to the mountains around Mount Mitchell and you may be looking at 23 and a half inches. So you've lost about 20% of the mass of the atmosphere just by going up. And if you think about pressure as being the weight of the air above you, as you get higher in the atmosphere, there's less air above you and thus the pressure goes down. Many people don't realize it, but they do feel changes in barometric pressure. Probably one of the most obvious examples is when you're in an airplane, the plane is going up, the pressure outside your ears is going down, and you feel like, oh, I can hear, this is wonderful. And then you're coming back down, the pressure is increasing outside of your ears, and all of a sudden, for some people, it becomes very painful. I can demonstrate these pressure changes graphically by using two bags of potato chips. When I purchased them at a country store in the low-lying Piedmont, the bags were sealed but almost flat. The next day, the same two bags swell to the point of breaking at the top of Mount Mitchell. Your eardrums can also feel this pressure. Well, Elisha Mitchell was a true scientist in the sense that he knew that if he had one location where they knew the elevation and somebody could be there with a barometer taking readings each day at the same time, and then he could go up into the mountains with a second barometer and take measurements there. Then when he came back down, they could compare them, and he had a mathematical formula in hand where he could actually calculate what the elevation difference should be based on the difference in those pressure readings. One way to demonstrate how the pressure goes down quite quickly as you go up in the atmosphere is by watching somebody go up in a helicopter and uh, they have a barometer there and as they go up you can actually watch that needle move. And that's how quickly the pressure is changing. Now regular weather systems that come through the pressure will fall and rise but it's not quickly enough so you can actually stare at it and watch that thing move but boy when you go up you are losing air pressure in a hurry and uh, that demonstrates very, very clearly the relationship between altitude and air pressure. Elisha Mitchell, what a smart guy in the sense that he knew a lot about a lot of different things, mathematics, chemistry, meteorology, and so what better person to put all of that knowledge together and uh, discover the true elevations of the North Carolina mountains. And uh, we come to find, and we take a lot of pride in the fact that Mount Mitchell is the highest point east of the Mississippi River, 6,684 feet above sea level. Again, it was widely believed that Mount Washington and Grandfather Mountain were taller than the peaks of the Black Mountain. What wasn't known at the time was that the mountains of the east were old in mountain age and had been weathered down over several hundred million years. When Mount Mitchell and other peaks of the Appalachians were formed, they would have been as high and jagged as the Rockies, the Alps, or other young mountains. When Mitchell first visited Western North Carolina, he was one of a long line of people to view the Black Mountain. No one knows more about the people and history of the region
than Professor Tim Silver of Appalachian State University. From archaeological evidence, we know that Native people, Native Americans, were in the area at least 8,000 years ago, maybe as far back as 10,000 years ago. They hunted extensively in the region and made good use of its resources. The first Europeans probably to see the Black Mountains were uh, Hernando de Soto and a group of Spanish explorers who came to the region in 1540. We're not exactly certain of their route, but we think they came up from South Carolina, um, probably up by Charlotte, Hickory, Morganton, crossed the Blue Ridge somewhere, perhaps about Jonas Ridge, and then came down into the North Toe Valley. Now, for part of that time, DeSoto would have been within sight of the Black Mountains. I asked Tim Silver about Mitchell's early travel in the Appalachians, and when he first suspected that some of North Carolina's peaks might have been truly extraordinary. Several years before he came to the Black Mountains in 1835, Mitchell had stood on Grandfather Mountain and had seen the Black Mountain Range in the distance. He referred to it as the Black Mountain, as did lots of other people at that time. So when he arrived in 1835, he was interested in measuring a single point on the Black Mountain, not particularly concerned with which particular peak or pinnacle or dome was highest, but that some point on the Black Mountain, as he knew it, was higher than Mount Washington in New Hampshire, which was currently thought to be the highest. During various trips, Mitchell used different areas to access the peaks of the Black Mountain. The Cane River Valley and its community of farmers and hunters gave him access to guides, and more importantly, homes in which to stay. It was widely known that Professor Mitchell did not like camping in the forest. Gentlemen slept under a roof. This was rugged, difficult terrain, as I found out for myself. Traveling through rhododendron, up creek beds, and steep slopes, Mitchell would often cover more than 20 miles in a single day to take a barometric pressure reading on a peak before returning to the Cane River community. Uh, measuring the Black Mountains was not without controversy. In 1855, one of Mitchell's former students, a man named Thomas Klingman, who was a lawyer, uh, a United States congressman, and quite a good geologist in his own right, became convinced that Mitchell had never been on the highest peak in the Black Mountains. There was a huge controversy. The men had once been friends. They became bitter rivals. And people took sides. There were those who backed Mitchell. There were those who backed Klingman. It is widely believed that Mitchell went back in 1857 to talk to old guides such as Big Tom Wilson and to again measure peaks to establish his claim as the man who measured the tallest peak. It was on June 27 of that year, perhaps during fog or a heavy rain, that the 63-year-old Mitchell rushed to get back to a cabin in the Cane River settlement when he fell to his death at what is now Mitchell Falls. Tim, it's been 150 years since Mitchell's death, and this place, the place where he died, is so incredibly wild. How would he have been in these, in these woods, and why would he have gone over these falls? There is a lot of mystery associated with his death. Um, what we know is that he was at the top of the mountain, maybe a mile and a half, two miles. Um, it was late June, June 27, uh, 1857, um, late in the evening sometime between about 8, 8.15 at night maybe. Everything was slick, wet, mm -hmm. and when he got down to this point, uh, either crossing the stream or perhaps walking along it, he slipped and, and fell to his death. His death made him a hero to many mountain folk and to state leaders. He was later buried at the mountain summit. Myth and history have the story of Elisha Mitchell bound together with Big Tom Wilson, who was both a guide and friend to Mitchell. Some of Mitchell's earliest guides were relatives or friends of Big Tom, a legendary tracker and hunter who found Mitchell's body in 1857. I was fortunate enough to be able to talk with Ms. Virginia Boone, Tom Wilson's great-great-granddaughter, who still lives in the Cane River community. 
I asked Ms. Boone about Big Tom Wilson and about the day he found Mitchell's body. He and a party of Yancey County men that uh, hunted with him on the trails uh, under the mountain. And Big Tom knew the mountain better than any of them because it belonged to his father-in-law, the property. And uh, he uh, knew uh, how he was a good tracker. He could recognize where bears had gone and animals had gone. So they knew that he would be good for tracking where Big Tom, where uh, Dr. Mitchell had gone. And uh, they uh, found where he'd been through the heavy brush, the heavy bushes, laurel bushes. And uh, they saw that he'd gone toward the little creek. And they decided, well, he probably would follow the creek down to uh, his house, that would take him out. So that's how they found him when they followed the creek. I wanted to know if Big Tom was really as big a man, a giant, as legend would have it. Most people think because they called him Big Tom that he was huge. I've read things of how he bloused over the chair and he was a slender person and uh, he was about six feet tall. The reason they called him Big Tom, in the family there was Toms, and they were little Toms, the children. So he was Big Tom, and they were little Toms. I was able to ask her if the death of Mitchell and the fame of Big Tom Wilson helped spur visits and tourism to the region. Yes, a lot of people came uh, in to uh, go up there. They wanted to see the falls where he drowned, and they wanted to uh, go on to Mount Mitchell, where the gray, where he's buried. Over the years, the Mitchell Big Tom legend has grown. The observation tower and grave have changed several times. Today, Mitchell's Peak is flanked by peaks named for Big Tom Wilson and his nemesis, Thomas Klingman. What a fitting memorial to their discovery and struggle. At the time of Mitchell's death, the Black Mountain was still a very wild place. On its slopes were virgin forest of spruce and fir. Below 4,000 feet, chestnut trees were dominant. The forests were still home to cougars and gray wolves, now gone from the region. Forests were home to deer and black bear. Bears were plentiful and important to the early settlers of the region. Mitchell would have seen tremendous varieties of wildflowers from the valley floors all the way to the 6,000 foot peaks of the Black Mountain. Today the same flowers draw thousands of visitors annually. Two events dramatically changed the forest and mountain ecosystems in the first half of the 20th century. Logging companies put in railroads. And mills. And clear cut much of the area in and around the Black Mountain. Between 1912 and the early 1920s, the great forest virtually disappeared. As if that wasn't enough, an imported Asian fungus began ravaging chestnut forest of the East Coast. Virtually all of the great chestnut trees disappeared in the 20s, 30s, and 40s.
The chestnut had once made up almost a quarter of the hardwoods in the southern Appalachians. In the last few decades, two new threats have damaged forest ecosystems on Mount Mitchell and other tall peaks. An introduced insect, the tiny balsam woolly adelgid, now kills Fraser firs. Red spruce and Fraser firs are being damaged by acid rain and clouds. The combined effect of the woolly adelgid and acid rain can be seen in the form of dead, skeleton-like forest at higher elevations. In spite of its problems, Mount Mitchell is more popular than ever. Jonathan Griffith, a ranger at Mount Mitchell State Park, helps interpret the natural history of the mountain to visitors. Mount Mitchell was actually North Carolina's first state park. It was established in 1915. It uh, was uh, based on a local grassroots effort led by Governor Locke Craig to preserve what was left of this ecologically significant resource, uh, the spruce fir forest. Uh, at one time, all but about the top 40 acres had been logged. Many people still confuse Mount Mitchell State Park with the Blue Ridge Parkway, a federal project built by the government during the Great Depression that began in the 1930s. The Blue Ridge Parkway, running over 400 miles through North Carolina and Virginia, is a major construction and engineering feat. Today the parkway brings many out-of-state visitors to Mount Mitchell State Park. Even from the very beginning, this has always been a popular tourist spot, uh, even though it was difficult to get to. And uh, that carries on right on through today. Now we have over 600,000 visitors a year. I asked Ranger Griffith how Mount Mitchell State Park was different from other state and federal parks in the southeast. Because of the altitude, our climate is similar to that of New England and southern Canada. So a lot of the species that you find here plant and animal uh, are not found other places in the southeast. Uh, for example, we have the Fraser fir uh, up here that's endemic to the southeast. It's only found in about eight other locations right in this area. Uh, as far as bird species, we have the cedar waxwing, slate-colored junco. Uh, those are also more northern type animals. Uh, as far as wildflowers, we have all kinds of them. The purple-fringed orchid is one of the most popular that's found few other places in the southeast. The next time you visit mountains anywhere or any wild place, think of Elisha Mitchell and the spirit of discovery. Join us again soon for another adventure on exploring North Carolina.